So I worked for 10 years behind the scenes in all the hospitals in Boston clinics and health insurance. And I actually was there when Mitt Romney did the whole statewide insurance. I was a part of that as one of the people who worked in the health insurance industry. So I've worked a lot of jobs. And that was the thing is every job I work, I absorb knowledge, I absorb culture. I'm always, always been very, you know, observationalist in terms of like that scientific methodology, because it's what I thought I was going to do. In this video, Rebe shares her failures, what she learned, and how they have shaped her career. Welcome to 100 Days of Trailhead, where the tech community comes to learn Salesforce, learn tech, get inspired, and invest in ourselves. We are your trail guides here to support you on your learning journey. We release videos weekly. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a video. In the description below, you can find links for everything we mention in this video, as well as books and resources we found useful. Visit our blog, 100daysoftrailhead.com, for other helpful Salesforce and tech content. Ruby De La Paz discusses her career progression, failures, how she overcame them, and how she became the leader she is today. Ruby is a speaker, writer, techie, teacher, thinker. She is a CEO, founder, and solution architect for RDP Associates LLC, as well as a leader in the Salesforce community. I didn't realize how many people I was mentoring, number one, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that led me to where I am right now, where I wear this lovely shirt, because I'm all focused about the balance, right? If I need to take a nap, I take a nap. Mm -hmm. I'm my own boss because I wanted to have the freedom to do what I wanted when I wanted. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that freedom was for my own health, my own mental health, my own sanity, mm -hmm. right? Because as women, we carry baggage. And a lot of times, and I mean, I'm, I'm unscripted because a lot of times the things that I speak about are things that are happening in my life or journeys I'm discussing with other people, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things was I, I didn't realize how many people I was mentoring lately, right? I was mentoring people already for the past years, but I don't really talk about it. A lot of people don't know. Like there's, there's a woman, she's a director of a whole Salesforce practice, and she asked me to be her mentor. And I was like, girl, I'll be your peer colleague. But I talk with her like once every two months. There's business owners that I talk to every other two weeks for an hour or an hour a month. And then I have former students who reach out to me via text, email. We have regular meetings. And I mean, one of them, I didn't even know, like, it's been four years since the first day I met her and she mm -hmm. worked at a dope company. It's like kind of crazy because when I met her, she was just like, I'm a journalism major. I don't see Salesforce. And I was like, you got to give it a chance. And now she got a job right out of college. Right. Like and she did development work. Like what? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's things like that. Any those hours in that 20 to 30 hours I spend a month talking with folks sort of give me energy breath and um it helps with my sanity because it's a reminder for me that hey you did something good right like you're more than you thought you were because there are often times where people may be surprised to hear this you know imposter syndrome is real and when y'all ask the question about you want to share your biggest failure, I'm like, well, crap, I got a lot of failures. Like, where do I start? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not afraid to share them because every failure is a scar that I will never forget because I learned from it, right? Yeah. You see, you be like, I'm not going to mess up that again because that's where I got that scar from, right? Like, I just had a discussion with a, another woman. She'd been in IT since the late 90s. It's a long time to be in IT. And yet, for some reason, she has been emotionally, psychologically discouraged mm -hmm. by those who allege to be her peers within the teams in infrastructure in greater organizations. So here you have knowledge capital, capital that the human resources department had invested in, right? We gave you a salary, you come here, you learn our business, right? 
Instead of saying, how do we take this to the next level? Because they already know the tier one, tier two, tier three, they've been here for 10 years. How do we take what we've invested in them and let them rise to the occasion? No, they keep them here and they never go anywhere. I want to learn. I want to take my potential. I want to be challenged. And it's like, no, <laughs> this is all we have for you. Matter of fact, let's dissolve your position. What? <laughs> hold up, you're going to dissolve my position and then you're going to tell me I got option A or B and neither one of them fits the potential I have in the knowledge capital that I've built to help your business be great, right? they rather go outside and pay more money instead of giving me a little bit more to go to the next level, right? And so it is, it's interesting because I've shared in those failures too. I've gone from those type of positions knowing, well, why should I stay here? I'm going to go to something better and I'll settle, settle for something less because it's better than where I was at. Mm -hmm. And that was a big failure for me because I didn't really um, capitalize upon my own, you know, um, value. I know my worth. Obviously, I felt like this company was not taking my worth, Right. And yet I settled for something less than what I was worth just so I can get out of that situation. And I, I really hadn't gone anywhere, like, right? So then you have to try to reinvent yourself and reinvent your path to try to get to what you want. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurship is the biggest risk. So like, where do I start with failures? I failed the admin exam several times. Um, before I passed it, but that was my own ego, right? And that Salesforce admin exam will tear your ego to pieces, right? Knock you off whatever. Yes, it will. <laughs> I swear, back in them days, I felt like that F was like the L, and it looked really big. I was like, did they put that sucker in sixteen point? Like, did they make it say fail? <laughs> I swear, I walked the journey from the building to the car, and I just kept seeing that fail word in like caps. I was like, I swear they made that big on purpose. Um, but from that failure, I learned and I reminded myself, tests are to test your knowledge, right? And so after that, I will walk into a test knowing that this is testing my knowledge, my true knowledge of, you know, this platform and so i use <laughs> i started using like hey if i failed the first time i use what i learned from that failure to get me over it the hurdle of failure to success right i took the <laughs> the consultant service and sales cloud i took both of them on the same day failed both of them right but at this point they were giving us feedback to let us know this is how much you failed by percentage wise. And when I did the math, I said, wow, I did not study for either one of these exams. And yet I failed by one question for each exam. I know my stuff. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, I got to just go back and study a little bit. I probably could just pass it now because I don't did it. I've been consulting for a while now since then, but that was at the beginning. And that told me a lot about myself. So that was a failure. The other failure was, um, and I, this is something I've been coining since I went into entrepreneurship, was salary withdrawal syndrome, that SWS. So you, you leave that job and you literally go through this psychological seven stages of grief, right, from the paycheck until you finally bury it because you know it's not coming back, right? You're like, man, this Friday I would have got paid this amount. It would have looked really nice in my bank account but I have to let it go. And I didn't realize how addicted I was to a steady paycheck until it was done. I was like, ooh, this is really rough. Like that first stage was denial. It's like, no, there's one coming, right? The second stage was like anger. It's like, forget that check, right? But <laughs> just, and it was rough. Um, the other thing was uh, asking for help. That was one of my biggest failures in my years uh, being in the community, the early years. I was more of a voyeur when it came to community. And then once I started to participate and ask for help, 
it was like kind of crazy because I was like, wow, they just gave me an answer for free. Like <laughs> somebody just sent me this link. It was like, oh, they gave me some stickers or mailed me some socks. Like this is kind of insane. Like people out here doing altruistic things. And it was just like altruism is real. And, you know, for me, it was like, man, well, if they're giving me this energy, what can I put in Mm -hmm. so that I can make this energy expanded, right? And so I want to say, for me, another failure was not, not recognizing the power of movement. And when I say movement, I mean social movement, right? It's like I knew And at the same time, I really didn't know, right? Like I studied it. I read all the books. I took all the classes on social movements, right? (laughs) Because I was, I learned, I took classes to be a a rhetorician. I write persuasion papers, right? And, And speeches. So how do you, how do you take that power and impact movement? And, you know, when we were doing pep up tech in the beginning, I felt like there was something that we weren't tapping into. And what it was, was the community. And once we did, it was sort of like this hidden manna of superpower (laughs) fountain, right? And things blew up. It was that community drive. And it's not just, when I say community, I talk about folks who work in Salesforce too. Mm -hmm. A lot of individuals who work in Salesforce, and it may not be a department that's well known, but that one person's support went a long way to help push the movement that was pep up tech and i don't think people really understood and 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 saw the power of that and i did myself and i was in the middle of it but at the same thing another failure was valuing my own mental health and well-being right and you know when we're driving success as business women we sort of tip the balances in favor of something other than what we should. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't realize I was drowning. I was drowning. <laughs> like, they didn't know I had a whole job. They're like, you have a job? Like, yeah, hundred percent. I have a job that paid me a salary with benefits. Like I had a whole job. I was working it. Yeah. You know, they were like, but she was doing pep up. Yeah. And I was doing a community user group leader, even though I should have let something go. Right. That's what and happens I, with the leaders though. Right. I yeah. mean, us community leaders, we, we get in and we, we want to help, you know, yeah. so we help here and we help there and we help there. And then just, yeah, totally understand, you know, then you're like, people don't realize you're drowning and you need help. You know, you yeah. need volunteers, you need, you need a nap. Like, yeah. you know, like yeah. you're like, I need an old person nap. I need, <laughs> I need some vitamins. I need like a yoga stretch for 10 minutes. I need something, right? I need, yeah. I need some like uh oil diffusers and like, <laughs> you know, just something, right? And it was funny because the people in the community who know me, especially my local, they was like, Reby, we see you drowning. And I was like, man. I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like I already started. I was on the train and the wheels was moving. And I didn't know how to drop off, jump off the train. Like, cause there was no stop. I was like, when the next stop? And this sucker just kept going. I was like, I need the train to stop. Yeah. So I could breathe and then work, work. I'm thinking it was ended. And that sucker pulled up, like, oh nope, nope. We're gonna keep going. Like, what? <laughs> what is going on? And people didn't know, like, my company, man. I, I don't know, like, I, I wonder my decision and at the moment I needed it. Everyone, I worked at a company where my whole practice left and I was the last one and they were going to close Salesforce. Whoa. What? Yeah. So a lot of people didn't know. <laughs> and it's only now I'd be telling the story because I feel like I'm not under NDA. I could share what I was doing, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like the company's fault. Like it was just how things played out, right? Mm-hmm. And instead of me leaving with everybody else, I was like, let me stick around, see what happens, right? Because they were like, let me do what I want. And I was like, okay, I'm fine with that. Let me do what I want. Cause I was doing pep up tech and blah, 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 right? And then um we had like a, a practice of 12 when I started. And like 
after a year, everybody left and it was just me. And they were like, hey, we're gonna close the practice. And I was like, what? And then I closed like, I wanna say close to half a million by myself. Wow. And mind you, I'm knee deep into teaching classes on weekends, helping Selena build program and stepping in where I can and mentoring students and like going and speaking at events and doing, you know, fundraisers and raising my kids. <laughs> and like still a mom. Yeah, like buying a house and fixing my house, like doing all these things. And at the same time, it's like amazing because people are like, how do you do it? And I'm like, you make sacrifices. Like you don't watch TV, right? Like TV is a part of your life as an 80s, 90s kid. And it's like TV got to go, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but uh, yeah, the practice. And then uh, after that, a friend, I went to a friend. I said, I don't know what to do about my job. Because they said they were closing, but they not. And we landed like crazy clients and I like killed it. I did some crazy stuff I didn't think I was capable of, like reviewing tech stacks and like, man, building out enterprise model roadmap strategy solutions, right? Like, you know, crazy things you don't think you're capable of, but they come to you like, can you do it? you like, challenge, I got this, challenge, right? <laughs> And then uh, the I, I knew something had to give when that next year, like the practice was still in, in business. And um, I helped them land three million in the first quarter, right? And I was like, dang, I did that. Mm -hmm. Like that was insane. And at the same time, like I said, I'm still teaching classes and doing tours and traveling like nonstop to go speak. And the whole time I'm speaking about equity, diversity, inclusion, the importance of diversity of thought, my own worth was being sucked in. Like my company didn't really know how to treat me. And I really didn't take the time to really be like, yo, y'all not treating me the way I need to be treated. Right. Like, and so that's when I was just like, all right, what am I going to do? And it wasn't until I had a talk with somebody and I was asking them about entrepreneurship because I wanted to, to be my own, but I didn't know. Like, I don't, I'm not like, I wasn't fiscally responsible or anything like that. I didn't have like a massive, you know, business savings and all of that. And I didn't know anything about that stuff. And yeah, they were like, yo, you already an entrepreneur. You know these things. And I'm like, huh? Like, I didn't think I knew them. And once they told me that, I was like, I am an entrepreneur. <laughs> Like even when people were telling me like, you're a solution architect. I'm like, huh? I was just thought I was just feeling the need and taking the challenge and doing yeah. things. You know, I taught myself how to build ERDs and, you know, a lot of stuff just made sense and documentation and technical solution designs, all of these things and reviewing tech stacks and making all the pieces go together. Somebody was like, you know, you're a solution architect. I was like, huh? Like, I never took the exams. They were like, you didn't have to take the exams. You did all the work. <laughs> I was like, okay, I did. And it, that's the biggest failure is that I had to have somebody else tell me what I was. <laughs> and it's sad, right? Because here I am mentoring folks and, you know, giving them the good vibes and I don't give it to myself. Mm -hmm. And well, that is like need somebody else. Yep. We need Sometimes somebody, somebody we, we need somebody else to tell us. Yes. Right. And I think yeah. also, I think as women, sometimes, you know, we don't realize if your own cup is empty, you have nothing to give anyone else, yet you're still giving it to other people. Yeah. And, and as community leaders, I, I think, you know, just to kind of go back to, to something that you said, you know your cup wasn't full. And so, you know, I mean, and here you are giving, 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 giving. And that's what I love about you. Like you're so strong. And I had no idea you were going through all of that. Like I like the, when you went up on stage for pep up tech at trailhead DX, I was like, Oh my God, I was, clapping. I was so excited for you. You're like, <laughs> The no whole time I'm dying inside. I'm dying. People don't know. Like I'm yes. on stage. And the thing about it is all my stage presences that I've had with Salesforce are all unscripted, every single one. Yeah. It's just one of the things I learned 
in all the speech writing classes and webinars and workshops and all the documents I've written and everything I went for my degree and studying Obama and Abraham Lincoln and Kennedy speeches. The one thing I came back to is, you know, you got to speak what you know. Yeah. And I always speak from my heart because I feel like that lends more to my credibility and the ethos and the pathos, the emotions and the, you know, support for what I say. My words, my word is my bond. Yeah. Like, that's it. Like, that's me. So every time y'all see me on stage at like a Salesforce thing, it's all unscripted. I think one was like Trailhead DX with Parker and he threw me off and asked me a question that wasn't in a script. I was like, dude, you're going to come and try to come for me. Like it was a split second. Um, nobody, <laughs> the only person who knew was, was my husband. He was like, I saw it. I was like, I don't think nobody else saw it. But he asked me a question that wasn't in a script. And I was like, no, he didn't. Like, <laughs> But other than that, like literally, and it's crazy because a lot of people don't know. Like we did, we did a, a, I had to do a women and trailblazer breakfast, right? So I was like, yo, I'm going to go in to pump myself off. I said, I'm wearing my phenomenal woman shirt. Cause I was like, it's a woman breakfast. Let me do this. I get there. I'm like, why all these other women wearing the same t-shirt? What is going on here? So then I'm asking, I'm like, what do y'all want me to talk about? They was like, just be you, just get on the microphone. I'm like, that is not fair. I need something to talk about. Like what topic? Am I talking about candy? What you want me to talk about? <laughs> and so guess who gets up to talk before me? Mina Harris, the woman who started Phenomenal Woman, uh, Senator, <laughs> uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's niece. I'm like, how am I supposed to follow this? <laughs> So I'm sitting there like in my head, like trying to figure things out as she's telling this wonderful story. And I'm like, this is going to be horrible. No, <laughs> like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you haven't and, heard yourself. No, I don't think. Man, it's well, I, I had an inspiration. <laughs> it's Stephanie recorded it. Stephanie Herrera, you should ask her for the recording. And I told her to hold my bag. I needed some like breath mint something. I said, can you hold my bag? And I was like, ooh, this is it. I'm about to quote Erica Badu, talk about bag lady and baggage. So I quoted Erica Badu and quoted bag lady and talked about how women in tech, we all have our baggage, but we got to support each other and hold each other's bags. I was like, oh. That was unscripted. Like I said, it was just like an epiphany moment because I was like, oh, this is going to be horrible. And then she kept, me and I came up to me. He's like, y'all, that was so dope. I'm like, thank you. I'm like, I just thought it. <laughs> <laughs> I literally was flying by the seat of my pants. And a lot of people, you couldn't see it, but that just shows how, like, I must have missed my calling. I was a great actress, man, because, man, I was like dying inside. I was tired, you know, like, 15, 10 million things in my head going through at any given second. I can't stop thinking because there was classes, there was programming, there was fundraising, there was my job. There was a whole tech design that needed to be reviewed and a solution and a scope statement and a SOW to be written. And <laughs> I learned the business of, of consulting because I was the business of consulting. And so it just, it needed to happen for me to learn so that I could go off and do my own and have the tools I needed. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I still felt like there were things I was missing, right? And so I made it a point to write out what I thought I was missing and make out a plan for how I was going to get what I was missing. Wow. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So you mentioned several times your degree. So uh, don't you have more than one? And can you tell us a little bit about your educational yes. background and how? Like, I know I was a professional okay. student. Um, I know Mike Gerhold and him, I talked about like my pre-med and, you know, I literally uh, started off in the sciences. Like, you know, y'all asked for like top five things, um, like hobbies and stuff. One of them was uh, I actually worked in the laboratory and I worked on uh, the growth hormone in bovine. That is cool. That is cool. <laughs> and I was in high school. And so like my professor, I was in the University of Illinois Research Apprentice Program. It was hosted by, it was uh, sponsored by like Kraft and a lot of the big, you know, organizations in um, 
they taught us how to be researchers. I took coursework. I was still in high school. So I went for a summer down there. And that's back in the day when you gave presentations on um, transparencies. So I had to give a whole presentation on the bovine growth hormone research that my professor was working on. And he made me work. My other peers and classmates, they professors let them play video games and had TAs to help. He made me work. I had to be there in the morning, go te- I had to make the, you know, the, the test subject and document and <laughs> he gave me three texts my first day. He was like, I've tabbed it out. This is what you need to read by tomorrow. I was like, what kind of insane world is this? But uh, yeah, I, I did that. I went to U of I afterwards, of course. Um, full ride pre-med had a depression it's only like in my 40s that I'm willing to talk about it you know because mental health it's more freedom now to talk about it than it was back when you were going through it in the 90s and it really wasn't something especially for black culture you don't really talk about you got some some mental situation going on and when I was at U of I I went through a lot of depression that second semester and I didn't know and I didn't know like how to get help (laughs) because you know all of those cultural uh boundaries and biases that have been embedded in you you know since you're like young tell you that you know therapy is only for crazy people right (laughs) so you're like I don't need therapy I'm gonna figure this out but uh I, I did and I was in a, my father called in my lost years, right? Like I used to smoke a lot of weed and try to figure life out and worked, but uh, I still went to school. I always had this passion for learning, no matter what was going on. And so I ended up finding my way to Northeastern University in Boston. Cause I was like, I gotta get out of Illinois. I gotta get out of the Midwest. And uh, still pursued biology but English as well. Then I had children. And in the meantime, like, do I want to do this whole, you know, pre-med? So I worked for 10 years behind the scenes in all the hospitals in Boston clinics and health insurance. And I actually was there when Mitt Romney did the whole statewide insurance. I was a part of that as one of the people who worked in the health insurance industry. So I've worked a lot of jobs. And that was the thing is every job I work, I absorb knowledge, I absorb culture. I'm always, always been very, you know, observationalist in terms of like that scientific methodology, because it's what I thought I was going to do. So I I use that mindset. And um, I actually had children. And then when I went to go back to school, they turned me down. UMass turned me down. They were like, they sent me a letter, made me cry. I was so upset. And again, it was a challenge. It was like they threw down this red flag and I was like a bull, like, no, nah, you're not going to do this to me. So I went, I went to the junior college and I finished, you know, whatever requirements in a year. And I did all their honors and scholars and transfer programs. And I had a chance to go to Harvard. And the uh, counselor go, you could go to Harvard. And I was like, I want to go to Harvard. I already went to a Northeastern and a U of I. She was like, it is Harvard. Like, she had me in her office like for a whole hour. Kept going, it's Harvard. And I'm like, I got kids. I'm not going back to Boston. Like, <laughs> then I went to UMass and was like, you accept me now? Like, they're like, yes. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I took all I, at the end when I finished, I had like a hundred and um, eighty nine credits, almost <laughs> enough for like a bachelor's and a master's. Um, but I had double in minors, so biology, English writing, literature, history. So just like I said, I love learning. <laughs> Hashtag brilliant. You are brilliant. (laughs) I was just thinking, well, before I came into Salesforce, I was going to pursue my um, master's. So I'd already been applying to, you know, universities in Illinois for my master's to um, be a professor. Like that was my goal. It's still my goal. And that's something, and I'm actually doing it now because I actually teach 
curriculum at City Colleges of Chicago. We teach a free Salesforce class, myself, Liz Halanga, and Allison Park, and we built the program and we teach it. And we're not teaching this fall, we're gonna teach in the spring because we're trying to onboard more community members who wanna be teachers and teach this class. And then we can build more classes and we wanna make it sure it's free because the whole goal for us is to bring more diverse demographics into the Salesforce ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, City Colleges gave us that they continue education program. We love it. So. so I have a question for you. Um, okay, so we as Black women often, you know, have been taught often that, um, you know, we have to do twice as much, you know, and, you know, or three times as much to get you know, this in, in the same place as white people. Do you feel that some of that education has something to do with it? Because for me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak about myself right now. For me, I know I felt like, oh, okay. I have an associate's degree in sign language interpreting. I got a master's degree in excuse me, a bachelor's degree in liberal arts, a master's degree in adult education and training. And just like you, I had a lot of credits because I major, I tried to major in everything. <laughs> and then I ended up in tech. So my question is, do you think that some of the, you know, pursuit of education, and I was actually applying for a PhD program before I went to Salesforce or before I decided to go into tech. So my question for you is, do you think that some of that, that, that the need for the continuous education somewhat comes out of that, that feeling that I have to do so much more, like I'm thinking about you and even working in this job, you were the only person there, right? And you're doing everything you're doing all of the work, you know, and it's almost this feeling of, wow, did she feel, you know, did, is, is, did that uh, play a factor in it? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's fun you ask that question. And with that, we're at the end. What in this video made you think? Comment below. We would also love to hear what video topics you want us to cover in future videos in the comments. If you've made it to this point, we want to take an opportunity to say thank you. Since you've stayed with us, here's a bonus tip. What might seem like a failure is a learning opportunity to stretch you so you are ready for the next opportunity. Thank you for spending time with us. Please like and subscribe to our channel because we share weekly content to support your tech and Salesforce learning journey. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss a new video. We also handpick these videos which we recommend you watch next. Connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and on 100daysoftrailhead.com, all of which are listed below. Thank you for learning with us and we'll see you back tomorrow.